Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for watching uh, this regular press conference on COVID-19. Uh, whether you watch it on our Twitter, Facebook, YouTube channel, or you have uh, dialed in, or you are watching through Zoom. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Pedros, our Director General. We have Dr. Maria Van Kierkov, and we have Paul Molinaro, who is our Chief for Operation Support and Logistics. We also have uh, Dr. Mike Ryan on the phone, who will be able to answer some questions. Before uh, I give the floor to Dr. Tedros, just uh, two small announcements. Uh, WHO has activated its uh, business continuity plan, and this is in order to adhere to good health, public health uh, guidance, as well as to deliver on its mandate. From today, all staff is performing their functions through teleworking arrangements. Only staff whose critical functions can only be performed on the site will have access to this campus. Therefore, there will be no media presence on WHO campus as of to today. Uh, WHO media team will continue to provide normal services through Skype, email, and phone. Our regular briefings will be virtual press conferences, and our audiovisual team will continue to provide uh, necessary support. So from now on, the, we will not have a journalist in the room, and then we will inform you if that changes. The second information is that we already sent you the media advisory for tomorrow, uh, WHO European office will convene a meeting, uh, online meeting tomorrow, uh, 17th March, about COVID-19 representatives from the health ministries of the 53 member states of WHO European region. After the meeting, WHO regional director for Europe, Dr. Hans Kluge, and emergency experts will brief the press on the current situation in the region and they will be answering journalists' question on COVID-19. That press conference will be at 2 o'clock Central European time, and in the media advisory, you have details how to access this press conference. Again, tomorrow at 2 o'clock, WHO Office for Europe. I'll give the floor uh, to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And good afternoon, everyone. In the past week, we have seen a rapid escalation of cases of COVID-19. More cases and deaths have now been reported in the rest of the world than in China. We have also seen a rapid escalation in social distancing measures like closing school, schools and canceling sporting events and other gatherings but we have not seen an urgent enough escalation in testing, isolation, and contact tracing, which is the backbone of the response. Social distancing measures can help to reduce transmission and enable health systems to cope. Hand washing and coughing into your elbow can reduce the risk of, for, your, for yourself and others. But on their own, they're not enough to extinguish this epidemic. It's the combination that makes the difference. As I keep saying, all countries must take a comprehensive approach, but the most effective way to prevent infections and save lives is breaking the chains of transmission. And to do that, you must test and isolate. You cannot fight a fire blindfolded, and we cannot stop this pandemic if we don't know who is infected. We have a simple message for all countries, test, test, test. Test every suspected case. If they, have, if they test positive, isolate them and find out who they have been in close contact with up to two days before they developed symptoms and test those people too. Every day, more tests are being produced to meet the global demand. WHO has shipped almost 1.5 million tests to 120 countries. We're working with comp companies to increase the availability of tests for those most in need. WHO advises that all confirmed cases, even mild cases, should be isolated in health facilities to prevent transmission and provide adequate care. 
But we recognize that many countries have already exceeded their capacity to care for mild cases in dedicated health facilities. In that situation, countries should prioritize older patients and those with underlying conditions. Some countries have expanded their capacity by using stadiums and gyms to care for mild cases with severe and critical cases cared for in hospitals. Another option is for patients with mild disease to be isolated and cared for at home. Caring for infected people at home may put others in the same household at risk. So it's critical that caregivers follow WHO's guidance on how to provide care as safely as possible. For example, both the patient and their caregivers should wear a medical mask when they are together in the same room. The patient should sleep in a separate bedroom to others and use a different bathroom. Assign one person to care for the patient, ideally someone who is in good health and has no underlying conditions. The caregiver should wash their hands after any contact with their patient or their immediate environment. People infected with COVID-19 can still infect others after they stop feeling sick. So these measures should continue for at least two weeks after symptoms disappear. Visitors should not be allowed until the end of this period. There are more details in WHO's guidance. Once again, our key message is test, test, test. This is a serious disease. Although the evidence we have suggested that those over 60 are at highest risk, young people, including children, have died. WHO has issued new clinical guidance with specific details on how to care for children, older people, and pregnant women. So far, we have seen epidemics in countries with advanced health systems, but even they have struggled to cope. As the virus moves to low-income countries, we're deeply concerned about the impact it could have among populations with high HIV prevalence or among malnourished children. That's why we're calling on every country and every individual to do everything they can to stop transmission. Washing your hands will help to reduce your risk of infection, but it's also an act of solidarity because it reduces the risk you will infect others in your community and around the world. Do it for yourself, do it for others. We also ask people to express their solidarity by refraining from hoarding essential items, including medicines. Hoarding can create shortages of medicines and other essential products, which can exacerbate suffering. We are grateful to everyone who has contributed to the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. Since we launched it on Friday, more than 110,000 people have contributed almost 19 million US dollars. These funds will help to buy diagnostic tests, supplies for health workers, and support research and development. If you would like to contribute, please go to who.int and click on the orange donate button at the top of the page. We are also grateful for the way different sectors of society are coming together. This started with the Safe Hands Challenge, which has started celebrities, world leaders, and people everywhere demonstrating how to wash their hands. This afternoon, WHO and the International Chamber of Commerce issued a joint call to action to the global business community. 
the ICC will send regular advice to its network of more than 45 million businesses to protect their workers, customers, and local communities, and to support the production and distribution of essential supplies. I would like to thank Paul Polman, Ajay Banga, and John Denton for their support and collaboration. WHO is also working with Global Citizen to launch the Solidarity Sessions, a series of virtual concerns with leading musicians from around the world. This is the defining global health crisis of our time. The days, weeks, and months ahead will be a test of our resolve a test of our trust in science, and a test of solidarity. Crises like this tend to bring out the best and worst in humanity. Like me, I'm sure you have been touched by the videos of people applauding health workers from their balconies, or the stories of people offering to do grocery shopping for older people in their community. This amazing spirit of human solidarity must become even more infectious than the virus itself. Although we may have to be physically apart from each other for a while, we can come together in ways we never have before. We're all in this together, and we can only succeed together. So the rule of the game is together. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, for these remarks. I will uh, remind journalists uh, who are dialing in uh, by phone. It's a star nine. Uh, those who are watching through Zoom, uh, it's a clicking raise hand. If it's possible, really, to have uh, one question uh, per journalist. So. Uh, so we can get as many questions as possible from different people. And we will start with uh, Jamil uh, uh, Chade from, um, from Brazil. Jamil, can you hear us? Yes, perfectly. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, hello, Mr. Tedros. Um, my question is about Brazil and about the fact that President Bolsonaro yesterday on the weekend not only uh, helped to call a mass protest in several cities of the country, but also took part himself in one of them. Uh, how do you see this as helping or not uh, fighting uh, the virus? And what is your suggestions on protests, uh, street protests, in this case, specifically, specifically that we are? Thank you very much, sir. Let's start. Okay. That's me. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, what we know um, that will be helpful during this time um, of COVID-19 um, in terms of what the DG just said is everything that we can do to reduce the possibility of transmission between people. And one of the ways that countries are doing this is to stop um, gatherings together. Um, and some countries have, have taken different decisions based on the number of people where they've restricted that, th those gatherings. And so it's important that people do restrict um, themselves, you know, to go to gatherings where there's large numbers of people. And in doing so, that will reduce the possibility that people who come in close contact with one another can potentially transmit the virus to one another. Um, and so taken together with testing and, and aggressive case and contact finding, um, it's important that we limit our, our uh, participation in, in mass gathering events. Thank you very much. Just to remind that uh, Dr. Mike Ryan is on phone. Dr. Ryan, if it, at any time you would like to uh, add something, just unmute your phone and uh, start talking. <laughs> it's not a case this time, so we will go for, for next question, uh, Gabriela. Gabriela, do, you have, do we have her online? Yes, hello. Hi, Gabriela, please go yes. ahead. Hi, thank you. Do you hear me? Okay. So I'm Gabriela Sotomayor, Mexico uh, Proceso. My question is regarding Mexico. Uh, there are 53 cases and one, 170 suspected cases right now. 
But looking at the fatality rate with older people and people with diabetes, for example, in Mexico, there are 12 million of people over 60 years old and around 8 million with diabetes. So with this scenario, what measures should Mexico be taking at the moment? Thank you very much. So I, I can start with this and perhaps Dr. Tedros and, and Mike would like to, to um, uh, supplement. The measures that we would advise for Mexico are the same measures that we would advise for all countries. Um, and what we are aiming to do in our advice um, is reducing transmission for individuals, reducing transmission for young, healthy people, but also reducing the possibility that we are potentially infecting vulnerable populations. Um, we have adequate data now from a number of countries um, which have shown that people of older age, people above the age of 60, of 70, of 80 years old are at a higher risk of death. We've seen evidence from multiple countries that people with underlying conditions, such as diabetes that you just mentioned, such as cardiovascular disease, such as underlying uh, chronic uh, respiratory disease are at a higher risk of death. And by reducing the possibility of transmission you're re of yourself, you're reducing the possibility to reach transmission to vulnerable populations. So the measures that we recommend are the same. These are fundamental public health measures. It's testing, as Dr. Tedros mentioned in his speech. It's finding all cases and testing cases making sure that they are isolated and that they are cared for um, in medical facility. And if that's not possible, to make sure that they are adequately cared for at home and, the, and, and, preventing, and preventing transmission to, to loved ones in their household. Um, it's making sure that we have adequate numbers of labs that can test individuals and have testing kits that are available in all countries. It's using the basics, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, sneezing into your elbow or coughing into your elbow, coughing into a tissue and then putting that into a closed bin and washing your hands. It's practicing social distancing, making sure that you remain separated from individuals, especially if there are sick individuals. It's staying home if you are unwell. Um, it's working from home if it's if possible. Um, it's mobilizing your populations. All of the same measures that we've been saying every day are the same measures we would recommend for Mexico uh, as we would recommend for every government across, across the globe. Yeah, no, thank you. Maria had already said it. Uh, the only thing I'd like to do is stressing on some of the issues. One, for any country, one of the most important things is the political commitment at the highest level. Uh, because you know, this pandemic is not about the health sector alone. It touches almost all sectors of the government. And the whole of government approach involving all sectors and led by the principal is very crucial. And that whole government approach should also be able to mobilize whole society and make sure that uh, this response becomes everybody's business, anyone in, in, in Mexico. You know, this is, you know, something that can only succeed if all Mexicans actually be involved. This is not just for Mexico, but the whole world. It's everybody's business. And uh, that's what we're uh, suggesting to the whole world. And uh, it will be the same for, for, for Mexico. And we hope to see uh, progress in the whole of government approach, all of society approach, and make sure, making sure that this is everybody's business. That's how we can stop this virus. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ryan, would you like to add something? Uh, no, no uh, sorry, I think uh, uh, Dr. Tedder said it right on the start. Okay, thank you very much. Please uh, jump in anytime you want. Uh, I will go now to a question from Norway that we received uh, via text. Uh, it's uh, Henrietta uh, Haynes, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce well. This The question is for Maria. And uh, it's, uh, it says, Maria, would Maria be able to comment on the new aerosol study and various surface studies, or possibly provide a general update on what do you know today? That's from uh, Henrietta Haynes from Norway, NTB, and The Journal. So Henrietta, thank you for that, um, that question. That highlights the evidence-based nature of our organization and 
what we are trying to do in terms of making uh, guidance for all countries. And we try to pull together all available evidence on different topics. This one that you've mentioned about the role of virus persistence on surfaces and the potential for the virus to remain in the air. So we are aware of several studies um, that have been published, that are in the process of being published, and that are currently underway in labs in a number of countries that have looked at different environmental conditions in which the virus could persist, looking at maybe different humidity or different temperature, um, UV light, uh, and that have looked at different surfaces, such as steel, you know, hard, hard surfaces. Um, and looking at the new virus, the new COVID-19 virus, as it compares to other uh, coronaviruses like SARS or like MERS or the common cold coronaviruses that are, that are circulating. Um, and there is a recent study that came out that looked at the role of aerosol generating procedures um, that, that could, how would those viruses, as you know, um, this is a virus that is transmitted through droplets. And so these are little pieces of um, liquid that come out of people's noses and mouths if they cough or they sneeze and they talk. And what we know about droplet transmission is that when they're, they come out of an infected person and individual is they go a certain distance, but then they settle. And so that's why we have the distance of the one to two meters apart from individuals. But when you do an aerosol generating procedure, like in a medical care facility, you have the possibility to what we call aerosolize these particles, which means they can stay in the air a little bit longer. Um, and in that situation, in healthcare facilities, it's very important that healthcare workers take additional precautions when they're working on patients and doing those procedures. But for the everyday person, it's the talking and the sneezing and the coughing, which is why we want the respiratory etiquette. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm speaking too long. But these studies are looking at how long uh, these viruses can persist in the air. And the one study that came out looked at the aerosol generating procedure and said that when you do those, that these particles can stay in the air longer than they would if you we're just normally talking to, to someone. So we use this information to make sure that our guidance is appropriate. And so far from the available studies that we have seen, we are confident that the guidance that we have is appropriate, which is so people um, who are in the communities, they don't wear a medical mask unless they themselves are sick because this prevents them from infecting someone else. But in healthcare facilities, we make sure that healthcare workers use standard um, droplet precautions with the exception if they have, uh, they're doing an aerosol generating procedure, and then we recommend airborne precautions. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is very important uh, to, to, to provide that, right, to, to our journalists information, what we know. Uh, let's go to the next uh, question, Adrian from uh, Romania. Adrian, can you hear us? Yes, hello. Yes. Uh, I'm from Proto yeah. Romania. Uh, authorities in China and South Korea have decided to isolate the areas affected by coronavirus and have managed to reduce the number of infections. But the uh, European Union supports keeping the borders open. What is the best solution recommended by the World Health Organization? So I can start with that. Um, so we recommend that all cases and all contacts are followed. So if with the aggressive uh, case finding and testing of cases, we will know where the virus is. It is important for countries to know where the virus is circulating within their countries and who is infected and who is not infected. By finding all cases um, and isolating them, providing adequate care for them, by following all of their contacts and making and testing those contacts um, to ensure that we find any possibility of onward human-to-human -human transmission. By doing so, you can effectively stop uh, transmission between people. In addition to that, um, rapid testing, immediate isolation of individuals so that they, you're taking them away from other individuals that they can, they can uh, infect. This is the most effective way that we can limit human-to-human -human transmission. Um, in addition, as what the DG said, is high levels of political support, making sure that there's an all-of-government approach. It's not just the health sector. It's involving all different sectors of the government to repurpose themselves to fight this virus. It's ensuring that every single person in the country, in China, in Korea, in every single country knows what their role is. How can I protect myself? How can I protect my family? What role do I have to play in actually preventing onward transmission? And some of this does involve self-isolation. Some of this does involve take, making some sacrifices that you don't 
um, participate in social engagement. And we've said this before, um, this is going to be difficult for, for a while, but this will be temporary. Um, and it's important that we all play a role in this. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I uh, have spoken to many uh, ministers from uh, Europe, especially, and of course, other uh, regions. And one of the areas we have discussed is about um, testing. And our recommendation from WHO was very, very clear uh, that all countries should be able to test all suspected cases. They cannot fight these pandemics blindfolded. They should know where the cases are. And, you know, everything about, you know, the cases. And that's how they can take decisions, actually. If they know the cases, then they move into, uh, you know, following up with contacts and also isolating the cases and the contacts would be uh, positive and not only that, you know, specific to uh, taking care of the specific uh, cases or the positive cases or the contacts, but that can help them also on how they can uh, design their strategy uh, to fight the pandemics. So that's, that was my message to many of the ministers I have spoken to, to invest in testing, and that was my speech also uh, today. Uh, and uh, going forward, uh, our recommendation is that they, they have to be able to test all suspected cases and then do everything that should be done, starting from uh, the uh, testing or the cases they uh, identify. And in addition to that, uh, we have also discussed about the containment strategy. Um, of course, we uh, said last week that the situation is already a pandemic proportion, uh, but at the same time, we have said that the contain containment strategy still holds as the best uh, strategy. And this is because of what we have seen in countries who have made progress this is in China, South Korea, Singapore. It's the containment strategy that, that's showing a result and which we hope can also uh, help other countries to, to make uh, progress. Uh, so we, 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 we advise countries to stick to testing and from there, of course, all the steps that they need to do and we advise countries to stick to containment strategy because we believe that this uh, epidemics, this pandemics, or this virus is uh, controllable. And the result or the outcome is in our hands. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the... Um, Tarek, 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 this is Mike. Can I, can I just add something? Uh, yes. Please go ahead, Mike. Yeah, just uh, and, and, and obviously, uh, uh, Dr. Kerbis has spoken to, to those high-level contacts and the importance of them. Um, the the we've we've consistently said that uh, travel measures, particularly uh, uh, draconian travel measures, are pa are only part of a, a comprehensive strategy. And countries who rely on travel measures as a way of blocking the virus are are just not uh, going to succeed. Uh, Rational measures based on risk assessment that restrict uh, travel, particularly for sick individuals or exit screening, and various measures that can, can reduce the spread of disease are appropriate in the context of a comprehensive strategy. Uh, many countries have implemented uh, lockdowns and, and, and other measures. These are an attempt to try and slow down the spread of the virus. But within the zones that are locked down, that has no impact. And we go back to the same public health measures of trying to suppress infection within a zone. So what can deal with infection within a given zone and then what can slow down infection spreading between zones are different types of measures. But relying purely on static travel measures as a means of protecting populations is not enough. It may be useful in certain circumstances. It may have an impact, but it will not have any impact without the implementation of comprehensive approaches. And, and just one clarification, when we speak about testing all uh, suspect cases, that's extremely important. 
And when we have identified those their contacts, we also need to test any contacts who are symptomatic. Just to be clear, that we're not advising that every uh, every contact of every case can or should be tested. We really need to focus on ensuring that when we identify cases that we uh, exhaustively follow the contacts. And if any contacts are showing any symptoms of disease, they should be immediately tested as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Dr. Ryan is in Ireland calling us from there. Uh, let's go to Tehran. Tehran uh, Times, International Daily. Uh, Mariam, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, Mariam, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, my question, uh, my, I, actually I have two questions. Uh, some believe that the number of new cases and deaths reported every day by countries are not real, as some countries might be under-reporting intentionally or some might not test all the patients, especially those with uh, mild symptoms. So is it possible that, that the number of cases is much higher, therefore the death rate is lower? And I would also like to know if WHO has assessed effectiveness of uh, traditional medicine on treating or relieving the symptoms of COVID-19. Thank you very much, Myram. We agree that we will have one question per person. There are lots of questions. I, I have to apologize right now to, to join with uh, that uh, not everyone will be able to ask the question. <coughs> yes, I will start, and then maybe uh, um, Dr. Tedros and Mike I will want to um, supplement. Yes, um, there's no doubt that we are missing cases. Um, I think we need to be realistic about this. Um, the, the, the reason that we are so um, aggressive in our statements about finding all cases and testing cases is, is because we need to know where this virus is. But it is possible that we are missing cases that are on the more mild end of the spectrum. That's normal in, in an outbreak. It's normal for a respiratory disease, especially because certainly in the beginning of outbreaks, you're focusing on people who seek care. Um, and so that's where people will show up and they have a higher likelihood of actually being tested for, for COVID-19 or for any emerging pathogen. So it is certainly possible and it's highly likely that we're missing cases. Um, what's important is that there are measures, there are processes in place that countries can take to find those cases. Um, and it's important that we don't give up um, and we move to a measure to say, we're just going to let this happen and we're going to see, you know, hope for the best. Absolutely, we need to be finding, a we need to be finding all of these cases so that we can effectively isolate them and thus reduce the, the chances of onward tr transmission. Um, but ways in which countries are trying to improve that ability to test is increasing their lab capacity. So not only making sure that they have additional kits and, and tests in their countries, but making sure that they're increasing the number of labs that can test in individual countries, whether it's at the national level or the subnational level or the use of private labs, it's making sure that we have more testing capacity in addition to testing kits. Um, the other question was it relates to traditional medicine. Um, indeed, there are a number of clinical trials that are currently underway. In fact, it's more than 200 clinical trials and maybe even more than 300 at the last count. And some of those clinical trials are indeed looking at traditional medicine. Um, as it, it will relieve, if it can relieve um, symptoms of, of COVID-19 infection. Thank you very much. We will go to our next question, please, and let's speak to one. Uh, uh, Andy Coxa, can you hear us? Uh, Andy was trying to... Yes. ...for some time now. Andy, please go ahead. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. My question is actually about contact tracing. Um, and it's about the, I'm going back to mid-February and the uh, Westerdam cruise ship that docked in, and disembarked uh, people in Cambodia. Um, there's conflicting reports here in the U.S. for people that were returning from that ship that they were, there was a an, an actual false positive um, and that all of those ship's passengers were tested. Um, can anybody confirm this? The only, we're not getting any answers um, about whether or not that one person that tested positive was in fact a false positive. Thank you. Hello? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so I, I can't answer to that 
specific question about that one individual case. Um, but what we can say is that there is the possibility for testing that you may have a false positive or you may have a false negative. And so what we work with across the globe is we work with uh, laboratorians and virologists and clinicians um, to look at what are the most appropriate biological samples and when in the course of illness, in the course of a contact, should people be tested. Um, and it's important, um, you know, whether these are upper respiratory samples um, or lower respiratory samples, um, the timing in which samples are collected, and then, of course, the, the lab test itself. Um, there's always the possibility of a false negative or a false positive, which is why we recommend repeat testing where possible. Um, we know that that's difficult to do because there there is a shortage of tests in some countries, um, but especially for 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 um, people with epidemiologic links to confirm cases, it's important that if you have a high suspicion that they are in the case. Really apologies. We have, we have a issue here. Um, can you please? Uh, we are not able to mute you, Andy. Can you can you mute yourself, please? No, Okay. Sorry. I think we're okay now. Just to say that if you have a strong suspicion amongst a contact um, who has an epidemiologic link, which means they've had direct contact with a confirmed case, that you do a repeat sample. Um, and so that you, you have increased your chances of, of truly detecting if that person is a case or not. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can we go to uh, Sinhua right now? Who do we have from Sinhua Agency? Hi, hi, it's, uh, it's Liu from Xinhua. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, the question is um, the uh, U.S. the Trump administration is uh, has announced a, a plan to cut deep its global health funds in its 2021 budget proposal. That's a flash of more than uh, 3 billion US dollars in overall programs, including half of its annual funding to WHO. So um, how does it, the WHO think that would help combat the uh, COVID-19? And uh, could you also please give us an idea of how the US has contributed to the global response to uh, COVID-19 so far? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. You want me to take this for you? Yes, or Dr. Tedros. Yeah. What, you want to take? Mike, or? yeah. You want me to take the mic? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I can, I can begin or go after you, boss. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Um, I think the support we're getting for um, COVID-19, the response, is, is really encouraging. At the initial stage, we were a bit worried but now uh, we're getting almost close to the funding we asked for, and we expected we expect more more support. And the uh, announcement from uh, U.S. Uh, is uh, really significant, and um, we will expect actually uh, more countries to to contribute. But we're almost close to the uh, funding we asked based on the SPRP. Uh, of course, the initial focus was on uh, governments, and we appreciate uh, all governments who have contributed. Now we're, we have already moved to uh, asking contribution from the private sector and, and all citizens. And as I said in my uh, speech, um, more than 19 million has been secured actually in a couple of days uh, from the private sector and um, you know, the, uh, you know, the global citizens at, at, at large. And this is in two days. And we expect that this will, uh, you know, there will be a significant contribution from the private sector and the global citizens at, at, at large. So as we have said, uh, you know, proposed for each country to follow or use a whole of government and the whole of society approach, uh, we're using the same thing globally uh, to mobilize all governments to contribute and also all uh, citizens uh, to contribute. And the contribution so far is significant and encouraging. And uh, I know we will get the uh, amount of uh, funding uh, we need. But I would like to use this opportunity because you have uh, identified U.S. specifically 
uh, use this opportunity to, ta- to thank the U.S. government, other governments, the private sector, and all global citizens for their, for their uh, commitment. We're all in this uh, together. It's a common uh, enemy. And it's our unity that will uh, break uh, this, this, this virus. And the last few days I have seen how, you know, the human spirit is so amazing and, you know, um, how uh, it shows us uh, that uh, the spirit can, can break uh, the virus. So it's not just the funding, by the way. It's the human spirit which we see the human spirit that that's fighting this virus, which is coming uh, more and more or stronger, uh, that can help us to fight it. When there is unity and solidarity of spirit, and then uh, the resources and and other things can come. So I'm I'm really encouraged, especially the last uh, one week or so, uh, with the solid level of solidarity that I I, I see. Yeah. Sorry. Please. Yes, please go ahead, Mike. No, I just want to add because um, you know uh, the, the U.S. Uh, Public Health Service is 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 one of the, the finest in the world, and not only has served the U.S. well, but over the last uh, 50 years has uh, helped to train and develop public health systems all over the world: field epidemiology training programs, laboratory networks, and others. The National Institutes of Health. An amazing uh, platform for, for, for primary research, for clinical trials, and others. The, the FDA has been hugely helpful to WHO over the years in regulatory aspects of developing new medicines. And uh, we thank them, all of those institutions, uh, uh, Tony Fauci, Bob Redfield, uh, and all of our colleagues at HHS for their technical and operational support to us and to the world over many, many years, and including in, in this response. Clearly, we, we all need to invest more in global public health, in national public health. We're, we're paying a price for underinvestment now, but we need, as the DG said, to come together. Now is not the time to, to look at that. Now is the time to work together. But we are going to, in future, have to look at how we are investing in public health systems around the world and whether we're actually investing enough. Thank you. Only to add an, an additional contribution from the U.S. is their, their scientists and their clinicians who are communicating with us regularly, uh, you know, on the front lines with us in terms of our uh, gathering of information and evidence and, and sharing of experiences. So we have um, American scientists and clinicians and public health professionals who are involved in every single one of our uh, technical uh, networks. Um, and so we're very grateful for them as well as clinicians and public health professionals and scientists from all over the world who are sharing their experiences with us as we learn more about this virus and as that evidence is fed back into our response. Thank you very much. We are receiving really huge volume of questions, so we'll try to go a little bit to those technical ones maybe because I think this is important. Lara Pinheiro is asking, do we know anything more about children and COVID-19? So this is a good question. We have, we have a lot of questions about children. Um, what we know from the evidence to date uh, is that children um, are susceptible to infection and that children can be infected with this virus. Um, they seem to be infected in, in terms of symptomatic infection, um, in terms of detection through reporting systems at a lower rate than adults, um, and, which is different to what we would see with, with influenza. Um, And from the evidence that we are seeing, we're not seeing transmission in um, settings like schools um, where we would worry about amplification of of transmission. In many countries, schools have closed. um, And so so that is an important thing to take into consideration. We do know that children uh, tend to have more mild infection, have more mild disease, but we have seen children die from this infection. So we can't say universally that it's mild in children. So it is important that we protect children as as vulnerable, as a vulnerable population. Um, What we don't know right now, and because we don't have serologic tests yet, and we don't have the results of these population-based serosurveys, is we don't know the extent of a subclinical or or asymptomatic infection in children. Um, And so we're waiting for the results of those, um, which will help us really understand what role children are playing in this. 
Um, so just to summarize, we know that children can be infected. We know that they tend to have mild disease, but they can die from this infection. So it's important that we protect them. Another technical one, uh, maybe if we might, it's uh, Stéphane here from Switzerland, from Le Temps. Uh, he's asking, uh, what do you think about the uh, possibility of short-lived immunity and the risk of having a massive wave of COVID-19 in the next fall? So the question of immunity is, is also a good one. Uh, you know, these are the same questions we're asking, so, so these are the right questions. Um, there are some initial studies that are looking at an immune response in individuals. We've seen some studies that have come out that have looked at an immune response in non-human primates. The data is very early. Um, and, and what we're looking for is whether or not we see a robust response uh, in, in people and for how long that will last. We're still 11, 12 weeks into this outbreak, and so and we do have some serologic assays that have been developed in a number of countries, um, and so we don't have a full answer to this yet, um, but it is something that is very important to see what level of, a, of response individuals have in terms of an antibody response, whether this will provide protection and for how long. Thank you very much. Uh, let's try to get someone online. Our friend Antonio from EFE. Antonio, can you hear us? Uh, yes, Tariq, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. One question. So Spain has declared a lockdown to prevent the spread of coronavirus, but today we are still seeing images of overcrowded public transport in cities like Madrid. So do you think societies have to take more seriously the threat of COVID-19? Uh, how can we really convince the population to stay at home? Yeah. Um, to convince uh, the public, first of all, um, 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 I would like to comment the very courageous and uh, bold action that the uh, uh, Spanish government has taken. Uh, I had a chance to speak to Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and uh, his uh, commitment, uh, I, I, I believe, is really, really strong uh, to fight uh, this um, virus. Uh, but the political commitment at the highest level alone uh, will not be enough. Uh, there should be the cooperation of uh, all uh, citizens of uh, Spain. Uh, it's the cooperation from all uh, citizens that will uh, make the response actually uh, complete. And I said it many times, uh, this should be everybody's business. Each and every individual should do everything to protect himself or herself and to protect others and should listen to the advice of the uh, national uh, authorities. Um, so my, my advice is, is that this virus will not be stopped without the cooperation of the government, the whole society and the citizens. This is everybody's business. And I repeat, this is everybody's response response and responsibility and that's how we can stop uh, this this virus and i encourage everybody in spain to follow the advice of the um, uh, authorities uh, muchas uh, gracias and my name is uh, pedrito uh, my other name thank you uh, thank you very much um, i will just ask uh, paul now uh, to give us a little bit uh, an update on where we are with the, with the supply chain and uh, PPEs, as we have been getting some questions, although we didn't get it right now, but uh, a couple of emails came earlier this, this morning. Yeah, thank you. Um, as, as, uh, as people are aware, we have been facing for several weeks now um, extreme shortages in the provision of and availability of uh, personal protective uh, equipment uh, for clinical workers and healthcare staff. Um, also, with the demand for um, greater testing, uh, greater availability of testing, this uh, also uh, puts under pressure the, the market to supply these tests. Um, and the third area of which we we taking a closer look at and where we see signals um, of uh, severe market constraint is around some of the more uh, sophisticated equipment for clinical management. 
So as we see definitely, as we've been saying um, consistently, that um, continuing to test, continuing to trace contacts is giving a window of time for the clinical system. We start now to see a lot of demand from full equipment um, to manage the wave uh, of patients coming into that uh, hospital system. Um, is, is this uh, a challenge? It is. Um, it, is it uh, easy? No, it's not. Um, is there a chance we can um, get availability uh, and, and, and provide this equipment? We remain optimistic. Um, certainly what we've seen now is um, a lot of contact being made uh, from Dr. Tedros uh, to highest levels of government um, and to CEOs. And we're certainly uh, looking at a large degree of goodwill uh, from companies and from governments um, coming forward to unblock uh, the situation. Um, it will, however, take a change uh, in mindset. Um, it's certainly not business as usual. It's uh, very unusual. Um, and if you imagine uh, a thousand hands with tangled string, uh, it doesn't work to untangle it by competition. Uh, it doesn't work to untangle it by, by oneself. It really needs to take a step back um, and work together. I think certainly what we've seen over the last uh, three or four days is the goodwill to untangle it is there. Uh, we are making efforts to increase availability in all three critical product lines. In lab, we are looking at uh, testing and validating uh, different samples for new reagents from new suppliers to independently, valid, independently validate those. Uh, when we have those uh, validated and quality assured, uh, we'll move uh, forward and expand uh, the availability of, uh, of those test kits. Um, so we, we continue to move forward uh, in that spirit. And thank you. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, there was a question from Jason Bobian from uh, NPR, and he was asking something along those lines. How can we expect countries to test, test, test uh, especially those with the weaker health systems, if uh, even some countries with a more developed system cannot do that? Uh, again, it's increasing the number of sources. Um, if, if one imagines the work that's been done up to this time has been uh, quite impressive. Uh, it's a new virus uh, with a new genetic, uh, a new genome that then needs to be shared, it needs to be analyzed, um, it needs to be researched. So the fact that we've managed to get uh, the testing uh, uh, availability that we do have um, in a number of countries is, is testament to that, to that will. Um, now that's the beginning. We have to now seriously scale it up. It needs to become uh, uh, industrialized to a degree. Um, again, with respecting quality assurance, quality standards, um, and making sure we are uh, providing the, uh, the right test for what we need to do. If I can add to that, if you, if you don't, I mean, there's two parts to that question, and, and, and Paul, Paul has, has eloquently described this. I mean, one is about increasing the capacity to test, and in increasing your capacity to test, there's three things. There's making sure that you have the labs that are there that can actually do the PCR testing. Um, and as we've said in the past, we are building on existing systems um, in many countries, and these are building on influenza systems, the national influenza centers that exist in many countries across, across the globe, making sure that at least one, if not more, labs can do P uh, PCR testing for COVID-19. And then within a country, making sure that we look for more labs that can do that testing, whether these are public labs or private labs that can do so. The second is the availability of test kits. And, and really, we can't emphasize enough how, how quickly this has come together on a global scale in terms of sharing the full genome sequence very early on in January and having the rapid development of assays by a number of labs across the globe, which has enabled a number of companies, a number of labs to develop PCR tests that are now being shared globally and developed globally. And the third is increasing the people who can actually run those tests in those labs. So what we've seen in some countries is that, you know, we, we've mentioned this before, that you don't have a, a, a uniform outbreak in each country. You may need to move people around your country to support where that need is most. And some of that is increasing your lab capacity workforce to be able to run those tests. But the other part to that question is about the willingness and the efforts to actually go out and aggressively find all of your cases um, and test your suspect cases and test your symptomatic contacts. Um, it's important that, that when we say test, 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 
this is what we mean. We mean test all of your suspect cases. We mean test for symptomatic contacts. And in doing so, you can, you can drive that transmission down. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, Dr. Ryan, would you like to add something to that? Or? Uh, no, Tarek, I think Paul and, uh, and uh, Maria have given very good answers. Okay, then we will move to the next question, Gigi Press. Uh, who do we have from Gigi Press? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes please. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, my question is regarding Europe as a whole. I'm thinking. Regarding what? No, regarding Europe, the situation sure. of Europe. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think many people are wondering why in Europe, where the health system is very much very well advanced, people are suffering uh, from the virus uh, much worse than Asian countries, uh, which are much closer to China. Um, is it just because of lack of tests that you just now mentioned, or is this because of the free movement across borders? And um, how can you explain the contrast between Europe and other regions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if Mike also wants to Sorry. jump in. Sorry. Yes, please. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very important to look at epidemics around the world uh, being in very different phases and very different stages. The epidemic in, in China began most likely in, in early December, the first, uh, the first uh, confirmed cases, and it developed over weeks. It accelerated. Uh, the government uh, had to react to a very bad situation in Wuhan and had to take extreme measures to try and push the virus back. I think uh, from the context of, of Europe, uh, that is a, a very a similar uh, a sort of uh, scenario. I think we have to look at the epidemics uh, as, as, as well, we call this a pandemic. The fact is that the epidemics in different countries are at different stages of development. Uh, Europe is, a, is, an, is an open, uh, multi-country uh, multi partnership, and uh, they have focused on, on strengthening their health system. They focused on trying to improve surveillance and uh, doing all of the, the, the same things that, uh, that uh, China has, 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 has done. Uh, I think uh, now you see countries like Italy and others really pushing back and fighting back against the virus in the same way that the Chinese provinces uh, did over time. So let, let us see how this develops. But I, I think, as we've said previously, it's very, very inappropriate to make direct comparisons uh, between epidemics which are really at different phases of development. Let's, uh, as DG said, let's talk about solidarity. Let's talk about how countries can work together and necessarily uh, comparing them uh, other than to learn lessons and transfer those lessons. And many of the lessons that have been learned in China, learned in Korea, learned in Singapore, learned in Japan are now being transferred to the responses in Europe. And let's hope and we can accelerate that in the coming days and weeks. <clears throat> yeah. Um... Uh, by the way, uh, some time ago, I, I tweeted a message saying countries, even high-income countries, uh, you know, should expect surprise. Um, this virus is, is new, and there are many things that we don't know about. Uh, and that's why I said, uh, you know, even rich countries should expect surprises. And that was also a, a warning call saying um, if you would have some surprises, then you should, um, you know, uh, be ready for any uh, eventualities. Uh, you should prepare, prepare yourself. So that's one. But the second thing or the other thing which we said from WHO side before, which I remember uh, fully is, um, the health system in developed countries or in high-income countries is lean and mean. Um, you know, they have been investing in efficiency for many years, and it runs at more than 95% per, of efficiency. And when emergency comes, uh, expanding it to accommodate uh, the new norm uh, is, is very difficult. 
And that's why many countries actually have, have struggled. Uh, and I think we will uh, learn a lesson from this. Efficiency is good during uh, normal times. Uh, efficiency is good when things are predictable. Uh, but efficiency w will not really work for uh, surprises, and that's why uh, well in advance we, we, we have to prepare the system uh, while assuring efficiency, but prepare the system to expand as quickly as possible when there are eventualities. So one thing that I uh, uh, have that was a surprise to me was Many countries have actually struggled to really expand uh, quickly uh, because, uh, um, you know, the expansion part uh, due to emergencies uh, was not uh, getting uh, attention. I may be wrong, uh, but that, that's what we, uh, I, I feel like uh, is happening, especially in high-income high countries. Uh, so the best thing now is how can we learn from uh, uh, this pandemic um, and how can we prepare our system? Uh, WHO has been advocating for investing in preparedness. And that's why uh, in our transformation agenda, we have established a new uh, division for preparedness and uh, we had actually a plan last um, uh, mid-March, uh, this March actually, <laughs> now, uh, which was planned well in advance, uh, to have the, a meeting on preparedness, specifically on preparedness, that brings uh, for a ministers, uh, health ministers, um, parliamentarians, uh, finance ministers together, uh, to discuss about preparedness, because globally we have a very, very serious uh, weakness in terms of preparedness, and WHO has been talking about this for some for some time now. Uh, our vulnerability and how the world is really, really at risk, and we're seeing that now globally, be it in uh, uh, low-income countries, middle-income countries, uh, and high-income countries. So our take is, while doing our best uh, to uh, suppress and control uh, this pandemic, uh, at the same time, we have to think about um, planning for the future, for the long term, uh, improving our preparedness, uh, making sure that the world is uh, better prepared, and identifying our Achilles foot and uh, really focused on our weaknesses uh, to uh, improve our overall preparedness as a global community. Because as we always say, we are as strong as the weakest link. We are as strong as the Achilles. And we have to really be prepared now. It's time to commit to, to invest in our weaknesses and minimize our risk as a global community. No country can develop its uh, or strengthen its system and, you know, protect itself from uh, uh, outbreaks, epidemics, or, or pandemics. The world is more intertwined more than ever before. Um, uh, globalization cannot be reversed. It's a globalized world. Whether we like it or not, we have to learn to live with globalization uh, the, the rule of the game now is how to live with globalization and um, uh, make sure that uh, we uh, act in unison uh, to build the global preparedness and uh, the global resistance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. And maybe one more last question uh, from uh, Kigali from Rwanda. Christoph, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, let, me, uh, let me come on uh, PPE. Uh, people are very, very scared of the disease and it had created panic. And they are doing everything just to protect, to protect themselves. 
they are now wearing gloves. The gloves are not in uh, recommended safety kits. Mm -hmm. Kids, what do you recall, what do you uh, can you say about the role of groups or impact of it in, in preventing uh, this, uh, the, this the the spread of the disease? Thank you. So, let me let me start with that. So first, let me just acknowledge the the point that you've made that people are scared. Um, I think it's really yeah. important that we do recognize that this is scary. Um, that people are scared, um, and that's normal. Um, what we need to make sure that people um, have is, is reliable information about what is this virus, how does it spread, how do we protect ourselves and our loved ones, and, and what role do each of us have to play in this fight against this pandemic. And I think that that's really, really important. Know where you can get reliable information. You can always come to WHO, uh, our website, and, and, and these press conferences, and um, and your leaders, you know, and, and national uh, guidance on that. So it's important that you get accurate information. There's a lot of false information that's out there. And we've been working very hard to ensure that we try to, to um, correct any um, false statements that are out there and any myths that particularly that can harm people. Um, but being scared is normal. What we need to do is channel that energy into something positive and making sure that you know what you can do to protect yourself. Um, what we do know that works in terms of your hands and in terms of, of what you need to do is washing your hands. Um, we say this all the time, and it, it may not be the most exciting thing, but it's the most important thing that you can do to protect yourselves. Um, we have this hand washing challenge that's online right now of getting you to, to show us how you actually wash your hands. And I think this is a wonderful, positive way to, to enforce this. Every single person that washes their hands is protecting themselves and is protecting others. So make sure you do this appropriately with soap and water or use an alcohol-based rub, but post those videos online because we would really, really love to see them from everybody uh, and get your family members to do that too. Um, the use of gloves are important in healthcare settings, making sure that uh, healthcare workers are, are using them when they're caring for patients. Um, we have guidance around the use of personal protective equipment for healthcare providers in healthcare settings or, or in home care. Um, really, wash your hands as, as much as you possibly can uh, and, and send us, please send us those, those videos. And that is uh, hashtag safe hands. So okay. hashtag safe hands uh, to see the video. Uh, Dr. Ryan, would you like to add something before we close? Uh, no, try just to emphasize uh, Maria's uh, Maria's point. Uh, we must uh, prioritize uh, protective equipment for frontline health workers who are going to be taking care of our sick. Uh, and uh, we also need to re-emphasize the point that Paul made. We need to be sure that health workers all over the world have access to that equipment. Uh, and we, we need to see equity in access according to risk. Uh, and we are pushing very, very hard for that. Yes, we need to support our communities and, and, and teach and communicate with people how to avoid infection, but protective equipment is not necessary to protect yourself or necessarily to protect others. But we do need to protect our frontline health workers. They're the ones that are taking the highest risks and the ones we need to take care of our loved ones should uh, they fall sick. Over. Yeah. And with regard to PPE, as you know, there is a market failure and we're working with the private sector to increase production because when there is the supply and demand mismatch, I think improving the um, supply side will be important. And I was very much encouraged by the commitment from the private sector to increase production, but at the same time uh, ensure uh, equity. This is very important. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Tedros, uh, Dr. Van Kierkegaard, and uh, our Chief Operations Support Logistics, Paul Molinaro. Thanks, everyone, for watching us. Uh, the opening remarks of Dr. Tedros have been already posted. If you go to our website and you go to a uh, page of Director General under speeches, you will find it there. But we will send it, in any case, with the audio file very soon, and hopefully transcript will be available tomorrow, and hope to see you again on Wednesday. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Thank you. Okay, so see you soon.